Good evening, everyone. Welcome, 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 welcome. We'll give it just another second for our live to, to touch the multiple streams that we're on. Welcome, welcome into the 41st Legislative District Virtual Town Hall, the second one that we're doing of the 2022 legislative session as we have just signed died. Welcome in, welcome in. I'm seeing the, the viewership trickle up as well. So we're just giving another second for folks to, to get here. Welcome, welcome, you've made it to the right place. <laughs> Okay, without further ado, we'll kick off our, for, our 41st Legislative District Town Hall, or virtual Town Hall, that is. Um, the second one of the 2022 legislative session that we're doing. We're very excited to be joined by our, our awesome and wonderful delegation here. And without further ado, I will, I'll kick it off to Senator Wellman. Hello, everybody. I'm glad that you're with us. Uh, maybe sometime, this may be your second time. Uh, we just thought so much was happening that we would... Um, Come, come and meet you again and give you another a chance to hear about what we were doing and, and to ask your questions if you didn't get a chance the last time. I'm Senator Lisa Wellman. Um, I am in the Senate. I'm chair of the education, the K through 12 um, education committee. We also have it part of early learning. So it's one continuum. I sit on energy, environment and technology. I also sit on Ways and Means and about seven or eight other work groups. So it's pretty busy. Um, and we've had a very busy time of it, as you can only imagine, starting around, I think it was the 10th or 11th of January, and it was flat out. And as, as Sam just talked about, um, we did Signy Die last Thursday evening. Um, and Signy Die means the session is officially over. And um, it's very dramatic. I wish you could really see what happens. We open the doors to the Senate. The House members, they open the doors to the House. We see each other across the entire rotunda. And at the very same moment, uh, the President of the Senate and the Speaker of the House bring down their ga gavels and everybody cheers and it's pandemonium. <laughs> and we breathe and we sigh and it's over. It's been a very... Um, very um, dense session, as you can only imagine. We we had so much to get done, and um, some things made it, some things didn't. But overall, I think that we accomplished a lot. And I'm going to turn it over to um, uh, Representative Tana Sen. Thank you, Senator Wellman. Uh, so in addition to doing operating budget, which is your kind of generic uh, big picture K-12 education, healthcare, um, prisons, safety net, all of that budget. We also this year did a supplemental budget because we have a two year cycle and this is the second year of the two year cycle. So we had a, a, a supplemental transportation budget as well. And we did a major transportation package. So that means that um, we haven't done one since I think 2018 where we've done such a big investment in uh, in transportation, we focused on making sure that things were green, that they were equitable, that we would did multimodal, and really focusing on preservation and maintenance instead of brand new projects. Having said that, we definitely have some new ones. Uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that some of the very exciting things, including include making sure that we finish 405 uh, and 167 and the expansion there uh, and doing um, the the trestle to be a uh, to be a bike path and um, and some some important uh, multimodal which is like bike ped bus uh, investments as well and that was wonderful to um, to also couple with the bipartisan infrastructure plan from the federal government that brought some money in including 13 million dollars for the brt um, from renton on north so um, I am Tana Sen. I think I forgot to mention that part, uh, state representative, and I chair the Children, Youth, and Families Committee. I'm also on the Local Government Committee, considering um, important because we have six cities in the district, uh, Sammamish, Issaquah, Bellevue, Newcastle, Renton, and Mercer Island, and Beaux-Arts Village. And I also serve on the Appropriations Committee, which is the House Budget Committee. Um, so we'll be sharing more in a bit. Um, my good colleague, Rep. Ty. Thank you. Thank you. So as um, Tana mentioned, my name is Milin Tai. I have the honor to serve as position two in the House uh, State Representative. Um, I serve um, uh, 
put this for the complete session 2021, 2022, um, as the, uh, uh, the vice chair of uh, my House Democratic Caucus. Um, I also am serving on the um, uh, Civil Rights Judiciary Committee, um, Public Safety Committee, and uh, and Finance Committee. And I often joke that um, we, I mean, you have this amazing delegations. Um, I work to find money so that Tana and Lisa can spend. <laughs> I think that is one way to see it um, uh, because finance committee is mostly looking at revenue and really um, debating um, uh, how our tax structure um, is working. And so uh, really working hands in hand with uh, Senator Wellman who served on, as she mentioned, a numbers of work group and, and, and our tax, uh, tax structure work group is one of them. Um, I, I really, uh, beside the transportation, I just wanna bring um, some highlight as far as capital budget. This is another, um, as, as mentioned, this is supposed to be a supplemental budget. Um, um, at the same time, uh, Washington State Legislature has pushed forward uh, historical um, capital funding, and and uh, I, I believe it's a total of one point five billion dollars um, uh, to ensure that we focus on capital investment on projects that create jobs and stimulate economic growth. Um, at the same time, emphasize on racial equity. Um, in all part of our capital budget and make sound investment um, uh, using uh, the federal funding. Uh, with that, um, I can't wait to, uh, to and yes, uh, and housing as well. How did I forget about that? Um, I, uh, I can't wait to really have conversation with you um, and, and answer your questions. Can I just say one thing? Uh, when, when Tana brought up uh, the transportation budget, I think that the last major transportation budget was when we were, um, it was before my time, but it was, th it was this uh, legislature that was headed by Representative, Representative Judy Cliburn, also from Mercer Island from the 41st. And that was the last, before this one, the last major transportation budget that we had. So I wasn't here, Milan wasn't here, uh, but Tana, you were there with Judy, yeah. Right. Well, well, thank you all for, for some amazing introductions. And uh, and we're going to move into Q&A and actually kind of a perfect segue, a springboard, if you will, was one of the questions that we had received from a constituent um, was that uh, what, what budget item for this district made it into the session or made it out of session, rather, just to kind of reword that a little bit. Uh, was there any sort of budget highlight for this district? Um, perhaps represent, uh, the representatives or senator might like to speak to? I think I think uh, Tana mentioned a couple of the things. Um, you know, it, it's really so important if you, everybody, every one of us knows the traffic on on the the 405. Uh, just getting anywhere up and down the east side has been such a challenge, and so we wanted to really make sure that the that the um, 405 167 uh, corridor uh, was fully funded, and that was. That was a huge one. Um, also, I would mention that we, uh, in the capital budget, got some dollars for the Luther Burbank Aquatic uh, Area to redo those docks there and that, that building. And so that's a huge one. And then also for Newcastle, we got some funding for their, uh, their fish dock and their historic cemetery. And I, and I love the, the mountains to sound greenway. There was a portion of the trail that was not doing so well or whatever, it's called the Bellevue Gap. And we got funding for that. So um, I, I, for those bikers out there and hikers, this is really gonna be a nice uh, fix and, and uh, really truly make it mountains to sound. Yeah, those are those are awesome thing. I think for, for me, I, I really wanted to highlight something that is not necessarily ended up in the 41st. So in 2021, uh, I was able to secure funding in the capital budget uh, specifically for housing. And part of it was the rapid acquisitions um, of hotel motel um, to turn them into more of a supportive housing or shelter uh, for emergency um, shelter for our homelessness uh, population. Um, and the project, uh, 
um, that the city of Bellevue was looking at in the 41st ended up didn't uh, didn't um, um, turn out uh, as 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 they hoped. Um, they ended up uh, looking at a different uh, location to acquire, and that particular place um, is in the 48th, and it's not in the 41st. The city of Bellevue reached out to me. And I say yes, uh, because I do believe that housing, affordable housing and all of this is really our regional um, issues. Uh, it's not about uh, what the 41st get or the 48th or the 45th or the 5th. It's about all of us. And when we come together and work together and find the best and the fastest solution to address uh, the homelessness issues, we ought to do that. Thank you. I guess Go ahead. So going back to the transportation budget, the, there's one little piece of it that I just love, and um, it's part of it. And it will mean that going forward, any young person under 18 or years of un younger can use all the transportation, ferries, buses, rapid transit for free. Um, and I think that that's going to be a nice thing for families to be able to travel around, take, you know, when you start to have to pay for everybody in, in the car, you know, to, to get on the ferry, it can really wound up, to, it winds up to be a lot of money. And I think that this is going to help. There may be some kids who are actually using it to go to school uh, around the state and certainly within the 41st also. So I think that's going to be a, a, a positive. Well, thank you so much. Um, and so uh, our next question, and before we, we really get into uh, the questions, I'd just like to say we, we did put a survey out into the community. We've got, we got some amazing replies. We've been kind of surveying the community, uh, surveying all the constituents for a couple of weeks now. So we have pre-submitted questions, but if you didn't get a chance to pre-submit your questions, go ahead and, uh, and drop your question in the comment. We have our wonderful team, our wonderful tech staff uh, in the background also pulling those comments in and, and pulling them in to try to load them to our question docket. We're going to try to get to everything we can. Um, but if you have a question or comment, please go ahead and just drop it uh, from when, wherever you're viewing. Okay, so our next question was one that we kind of monitored over a couple of different emails in these different offices. And folks were really curious about if uh, if our delegation had a favorite bill or policy that they passed this year. And maybe we can start with uh, Representative Ty. Well, thank you very much. Uh, oh my goodness. Uh, it, it would be sort of like weird to say, of course, every single bill we passed was like really our favorite and we loved it. Um, but I have, I, I have to say the one uh, favorite bill that I passed was a bill coming from our very own constituent. Um, and um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name him um, um, uh, Mr. Bob Ellis. So Bob came to me um, on, in, 2020, in 2019, my very first session, and presented to me um, issues that um, he faced and he believed that we need to, to fix what's in the laws. So if, if any of you um, who either love riding bike and as Senator Wellman talked about um, and, and Representative San talked about the expansions of multimodal, uh, including by lane, um, or families who just wanted to go out uh, to ride a bike at, in, at your favorite park, uh, we often pile uh, our bike uh, in the back of the car. And, uh, and because of that, um, we, we temporarily uh, obstruct the license plate. Many of, uh, many of us did not know that, that you have just violated the law. Mm -hmm. um, because the laws say that you, you may not obstruct license plate at all time. And uh, this legislation was about giving an exemption uh, to those who have um, uh, really put the, uh, the bike rack or wheelchair lift um, in the way that manufacturer recommended. And it is really uh, was intended for services, right? So families can go out. And, and so next time when you are driving or when you're parking, uh, either in the uh, Costco parking lot or in your local favorite uh, park, or if you're driving out in, in, in the freeway, and if you see bike racking uh, behind a vehicle, you no longer uh, violate the laws. It is exempted and it 
absolutely is an honor for me to uh, to bring this legislation uh, toward uh, uh, the end. Uh, it's going to be signed by the governor soon, and um, it is certainly my favorite. <laughs> Who's going next? All right, we'll go to Representative Sen next and then over to Senator Wellman. All right, uh, so this interim, which is the time between last session and this session, I worked with uh, dozens of advocates who are working with homeless youth and adolescents. And uh, it, especially during the pandemic, we knew a lot of foster youth who had either left foster care, uh, were struggling with housing and security, um, people, you know, behavioral health is at the top of people's minds. Um, and unfortunately, we have a large homeless youth population. So one thing that the state has always been committed to already is that we would not release any youth into homelessness directly from foster care or mental health treatment or juvenile justice. Um, but unfortunately, does anybody else hear a lot of noise? A little bit. Okay. Um, sorry, uh, but unfortunately that was a commitment we made in 2018, but we didn't give any tools to the state and to our departments to actually do that. So this year, working with these advocates who put together a piece of legislation, HB 1905, that creates four uh, very flexible ways to work with youth and with individual communities, nonprofits, cities, counties, um, to help identify and serve youth who are homeless and before they become homeless, like if they're leaving a hospital or leaving, leaving juvenile rehabilitation or leaving foster care to make sure that they do not become homeless as they leave. So rental assistance, making sure they can get a job, um, working with the court system to ensure that um, uh, some flexible funding and some other programs. So it was so exciting to see that pass almost unanimously every step of the way. Uh, we know we have a housing crisis, and the last thing we want is for our kids to be homeless. Uh, to, one way to prevent adult homelessness is certainly to prevent youth homelessness. So I'm thrilled that we made some huge headway um, and had millions of dollars invested in both capital and in the operating budget to help uh, with youth homelessness. So I hate this question. I really don't like it because it is so hard, and it, I, I don't want anybody to think that there's a favorite bill um, because they're all my babies and it's, it's, we shepherd them and it takes, sometimes it takes a heck of a lot of work to get them over the finish line. And sometimes they're our bills and sometimes they're not our bills, but as chair of a committee, you know that this is an important bill. This bill wasn't challenging at all to get over the finish line. And I think every parent out there will really appreciate this. Um, this was a bill that requires financial literacy. And this is, is for our school kids. Um, the idea that they would get out of high school without having to balance a checkbook, know about credit, understand keeping a bank account, understand, you know, how business works, how money is, is created or wealth is created um, is really, really seemingly, um, yeah, you should know that, but, but let's make sure that you do. And, what, and, and the interesting thing was, I think that we found parents loved it. It was one of the most requested things from students. They asked for it. And I think that um, the teachers are really happy that we're, we're adding that to the mix of uh, requirements that we really address as far as um, uh, our K-12 system. Amazing, thank you so much. And our next question was uh, was one about policing policy, actually. It was what was the legislature, or what has the legislature done to address some of the policing policy concerns from last year? I, I can take this. Okay. Uh, I can take a stab at this first. Uh, I don't like that, taking a stab at this. It sounds so violent. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Poor choice of words. <laughs> Choice of word, um, because I, I I serve in in both um, civil rights judiciary and public safety uh, committee this year, so um, we passed um, House Bill twenty thirty seven, and uh, and that particular legislation um, really helped um, define physical force. Um, which was something um, was not done in the last uh, legislative sessions, and um, and and 
and really just like last last year, um, the uh, representative, both Representative Goodman from the 45th and Representative Johnson from the 30th, um, really took the entire interim um, to go up and down, north and south of our state, uh, east and west, to really meet with um, uh, all the stakeholders, including um, our police um, uh, officers and, and, and those who really engage in this work um, to, to clearly define what is physical force, to clearly uh, clarify and articulate uh, what, what, what police can, can do as far as providing uh, support and public in terms of um, um, intervening uh, for public safety and, and really clarifying what some of the uh, terminology when it's come to reasonable care versus, um, uh, oh God, I'm thinking out on another terminology, but it's, it's basically, there was so much confusion as far as when a police officer can intervene, especially in the case of um, call uh, for mental well-being of our neighbors. And so that particular, uh, uh, both uh, the legislations came through and uh, heading to, um, I think one of them's already been signed. Uh, that was the legislation introduced by, uh, by Johnson um, to, to ensure that uh, our uh, peace officer uh, clearly know what, when they can intervene and how they can uh, do their job best uh, providing services for our neighbors. And, and if I may, one of the things that I think is also part of this question is what didn't pass um, because there was, there was quite a lot of um, interest in a bill that came over to the Senate from the House and it had to do with pursuit um, of uh, somebody in, in a car. I, I don't know if everybody is really aware, I wasn't, that most of the people harmed by pursuits are innocent bystanders that have absolutely nothing to do, either the police or the person they're pursuing them. And what we passed a bill last year that um, we tried to clarify this year, but last year, since last year, we have found that there have been 60% less injuries with this type of pursuit. And so I think that the feeling was that um, it's working. Um, I think that we perhaps need more clarity, but we have to see really what's going on. And so the bill didn't pass and didn't go any further uh, this year, which I think we're waiting to see. I also will point to Milan's um, discussion about learning about things and clarifying things. And I'm really pleased to hear the numbers that are going through the academy, getting training, which I think will be extremely helpful. And I also think that that's one thing that we have to make sure that we continue uh, to support financially so that there are there is a place for um, candidates to get trained to go into the service. Um, we certainly want to have more candidates, but they have to have the training. They deserve to have the training. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. So our next our next question is uh, is back to the operating budget, a little bit more on that. The uh, Does the operating budget have any tax cuts? Can you tell us about the state's reserves in the budget? Sure, I'll start with that one. Um, so, you know, we had a lot of discussion. I've heard uh, numerous questions about uh, the historic size of the of the budget, and one of the reasons is why we got a lot of one-time dollars from the federal government still as part of the COVID recovery. And so, we had billions of dollars that we could spend this year, and as um, some we put into the transportation budget, and some we put into the capital budget. Really, keeping in mind that these were one-time. Dollars And so giving a massive tax cut, which would be an ongoing thing, we did not feel was a responsible way to approach the, the funds that we have in our operating budget, especially when there are so many still uh, demands out there around mental health and housing and uh, reimbursement rates for different health care, uh, making sure we got more people in the pipeline for high need jobs, etc. So um, but what we did do, because we also know that small businesses in particular are struggling, is we passed a BNO tax break for small businesses. 
And I think that is probably uh, is a targeted tax break. It hasn't been done uh, in many, many years. In fact, my very first bill when I was uh, when I was, became a legislator was to raise the threshold. Um, but we have raised it dramatically to, I think, 125,000 before uh, b and uh, taxes kick in. So that is very exciting. In terms of the um, state's reserves, so uh, we have, over, so we have, when we do a budget, it's really a budget over four years. And in the next four, across the next four years, we'll go from about a 10% to a 9.5% reserve to about a 20% reserve. Uh, for our state budget, which is huge and really, really strong, just in case, knock on wood, it never happens, that we have another pandemic or emergency. Um, and, and to add to that, I think to the point that um, Tana just made, because we have been so careful with our reserves, before we, because we uh, uniquely have, have to do a four-year balanced budget, uh, and because we have so well-funded our pension systems in the state of Washington, we are one of the few, if not the only state with a triple A bond rating, which means that we get money cheaper than other places that don't have a triple A rating. We have been voted the number one state for doing business as well as one of the top states for being employed. Um, so um, I think from that perspective, we're doing pretty well. And, and to add one more little thing, in addition to the um, tax break for the BNO tax break for small businesses, we also invested in CDFIs. Uh, and these are community development financial institutions that lend money to small business. Um, you know that we had a problem before when federal money came in, it went through the big banks and they know who their big customers are and even you know the named customers. We wanna make sure that small businesses out there that were really hit by this pandemic um, will have access to small loans. These are loans that maybe are 50,000 or $100,000. And in addition to getting the loans, they also get some uh, mentorship and, and have the ability to really um, be guided by the CDFI. So they're, they're, they have been noted as one place where it makes a difference with small business. So I was really glad to see that money go there. And I'm surprised to say that Senator Wilman did not mention that we also did a tax break for the film and movie industry. Oh, yeah, you um, want to talk about that. <laughs> we've been talking about for years. We really increased that because we want to have more movies uh, filmed right here in our beautiful, beautiful state. So we passed that tax break. Um, and then also a little bit more investments on the small business, a $25 million arts fund to help um, our arts and culture recover, and also um, some uh, $100 million for our hospitality industry, both uh, mainly restaurants, but restaurants, hotels, um, other hospitality, and because uh, we really need, and, and restaurants, again, there's some liquor license um, forgiveness and things like that, just to make sure that we really give a kickstart to those small businesses that have been holding on or had to close and maybe hopefully reopen uh, during the pandemic. So those were all great things that we did. Awesome. Thank you so much. Our next question is, what is being done to create more affordable housing in King County? I, I can take on that. Um, I, I think at the beginning of our conversations, um, right, I, I kind of push out the ideas that um, is so I, I wanted to, to to thank the the person who who asking the question and it's and and yes I'm very aware it's very specific to King County simply because the forty first is in King County but um, honestly at the state level um, our 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 vote is is for the entire state and um, my heart is full I I think housing is an issue across our state. Um, um, and it's, it's not just a King County issues. And um, as I shared earlier, as far as our capital uh, budget, um, just even even if, if we're just looking at capital uh, budget, um, uh, we invest, uh, we increase uh, the housing trust fund, $113 million uh, into the housing trust fund. We put in $300 million into the uh, rabbit um, uh, capital acquisition uh, for for shelter. We uh, put uh, uh, $9 million into grant for the CHIP, which is uh, uh, affordable housing uh, utility connections. I mean, we, we put a lot of funding into 
the overarching ensuring that housing um, um, is is going to be um, uh, one of our top priority. And I would be remiss if I don't mention uh, because the uh, the former speaker would not like me. Uh, Representative Chop introduced a legislation that required. Um, um, uh, with the intent of housing this healthcare um, for for our healthcare providers um, recognizing or knowing uh, of their patient who they see by having um, a roof over their head would be part of uh, their well being uh, and so we fund um, uh, uh, for that partic particular program um, through Apple. Apple Care in Washington State. I mean, I, I can't, I really can't say enough of how uh, I am very proud of us uh, getting out of this uh, short session, really addressing housing uh, continuously head on. And if, Tana, you wanted to go, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, you know, for, for many people, we're following along with some of the uh, bills that got a lot of the media attention. It was the governor had introduced or had asked to have introduced some legislation that would have required housing um, multiple units on all single family lots. And, you know, that really would expand housing um, broadly in concept, um, but also is very controversial because of local control, which means normally local city councils, local cities control their zoning. And so that bill did not advance this legislative session. There was one also that just focused on ADUs, which are accessory dwelling units, like backyard cottages, um, to require those and to have very kind of specific rules around that. That passed the House, but not the Senate, so that didn't pass either. So there's, there's lots of work to do, but also, you know, each city is different. Um, and so we really need to make sure that we are figuring out how to expand housing quickly, um, but also with you know, with the unique nature of each community. And if I can jump in, um, of all the people in the state of Washington who live in cities, 90% of them live in cities that already have an ADU um, uh, permission uh, types of thing on the books where they can already have an ADU. Um, and, and this is really good because it points out that we had some suggestions come up, which really were, in my mind, not terribly innovative. We weren't going any place that we hadn't been before. We were trying to kind of double down on what we already had. And, and I think that would have given us some, but, but we're really in a crisis in terms of every kind of housing. Just, we are kind of the bottom of the barrel as far as states go in terms of having available housing for the population that we have and for the people coming into the state. And so this is the kind of thing um, that I'm, I'm bringing together a work group uh, with AWC, which is the Association of Washington Cities. Um, they've stepped up and said, yeah, we want to be part of that, as do all of our cities here in the 41st, as well as communities across the state. And I want to see what we can think of that's outside the box um, that we're not doing. How can we increase housing? Because very frankly, when you have this kind of a robust economy, uh, land is really expensive. And that drives up the cost, which, you know, which says if I to developers, if I'm going to develop in this land, I'm going to charge a lot of money and I'm going to build a certain kind of housing, but we need more of every kind of housing. So we have to be creative. And I think we have to bring a lot of different people to the table from all over the state. And I think that's one of the one of the three things that I've got lo uh, loaded on my list of work groups that I'll be working on over the interim between now and next year. Thank you so much. And and before we move on to that uh, that other question and get too too far away from the budget, there was a a question I'd like to spotlight um, in the comments, asking us to address the the budget for Afghan resettlement. And if we can just briefly touch on that. Yeah, and if I I'll just mention that we've got seventy four million dollars in the budget for refugee uh, resettlement and assistance, um, and that includes both the, for the Afghani refugees and for F, uh, Ukrainian okay. refugees with an anticipation. Um, and then I would be ridiculously remiss if I did not mention that Milin was leading this effort in the House with such 
commitment and um, in a very good relentless way. And this was just... <laughs> I, I love it, Todd. I, I love it how you would use the term relentless. I, I think I think like if it, if it was in the legislature, people would have say, "Oh my God, no, <laughs> this, this is exactly right what we need to do," and we got it. And it's because like you know when um, it just is so important. And, um, and so I'm just so proud of our state of the of our response of our welcomeness. And uh, we need to continue that. And so thank you, Lynn. And um, I'm thrilled by $74 million in our budget for uh, refugee resettlement. Do you want to say anything, Lynn? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm blushed. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's one thing that, um, you know, it's one thing to be proud as, um, once again, I, I, will give, I will give the credit to the 41st. Um, really, thank you for giving me the honor to, to speak to my very experience, my very existence of being a refugee, um, for understanding that deeply, um, and, and, and really to bring the voice uh, to legislature, that is that, that does not um, um, in any shape or form uh, really honor our legislature as a whole. Uh, because um, the, the budget wouldn't happen, and this budget is bipartisan. Um, the the uh, the investment into our refugees, into our new arrivals, into our new families, into our new neighbors. I mean, this is how I believe we should look at it. This is an investment into the most um, important resources for our state: human resources. And these are the humans who coming to our state will be part of our, 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 our community. And when we set them up for success, the, the return is multiple. And so I'm, I'm so proud of us. We're proud of you too. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Our next question uh, coming in through the chat was, what is the legislature doing to address the mental health crisis in schools? So one of the things that I'm, I'm very proud of that we, we managed to do um, was to raise the prototypical model, adding additional funding to our school districts for a specific group of people, people who are uh, counselors, psychologists, and social workers who can deal with these problems. And one of the things that uh, I think people should be aware of is the way we put money out to, to our schools are depending upon, on a, for 400 pupils, this is how much we put into a particular category. But once that money gets to the school districts, they can spend it any way they want because they have local control in general. This time we realized and we believe that this is such a critical and important area uh, that we said we're going to send more money out for this, but we're going to require you spend it only for that. And we think that that will really make a difference. I think that we're also looking at the um, community support, um, community organizations that have been amazing supports. Don't forget, we received three waves of ESSER funding from the federal government that went to schools. And much of that money is going to be able to help for recovery. And when I say recovery, it's kids need to get their feet under them. They need to feel that they're in a good place uh, before they really can, can be in a place where they can really advance their learning. And so that was really a necessary thing. And as I toured the state and talked to different groups in all of the nine um, education service districts, many of them were using some of those ESSER dollars to really devote towards programs for community health, for parents and teachers and, and the system to really get back to a place where kids are moving forward and advancing, really important. And we also spent additional money to um, help with mentoring students, one-on-one um, -on -one mentoring and other programs that are in the budget. Um, some of them small, some of them large, but really focused on working with, with children. Having more people in the building will be important so that there's more one-on-one -on -one time, I think. Yeah, and I and I I want to jump in uh, into this uh, to highlight uh, the the bipartisan work in our state. Uh, it's, it's critically important that um, 
that you know uh, we all care for the same thing. Sometimes we may speak differently or approach it differently, but we all care for the same thing. And in this particular topic, I really want to shout out to Representative Eslick, who is our Republican colleague in the House side. And um, she, uh, she um, uh, uh, worked on the legislation, I, I think it's House Bill 1800. And it's very specific of uh, requiring, and, and this is the piece where I have talked a lot about how our system sometimes do not talk to each other, and especially when it's come to mental health, behavioral health for our kiddos in the K-12 system, that the healthcare system and the educational system don't really talk to each other. And this legislation uh, is the beginning of that um, 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 meshing the two. Uh, this legislation required the healthcare authority to start looking at ways and, and start gathering and building stakeholders uh, so that, uh, like including parents, educators, mental health, behavioral health providers, um, and our students so that it's highlighting um, the needs and what programs existed or not uh, in assisting um, in order for the state legislat legislature to start moving into the space to ensure that, um, that not only our students are being cared for, but really the adults in K-12 being cared for as well. Um, I just want to add, so children's mental health is in the jurisdiction of my committee, Children, Youth, and Families. And so I think if we did a town hall on mental health for kids uh, between <laughs> the three of us, we could speak for a whole hour. I think we're all screaming. <laughs> <Just> watch it. <laughs> this is true. This is true. Um, yeah. Thank you. So our, our next question, um, our next question is what legislation passed this year to keep communities safe from rising gun violence? Ooh, I'll take that one. I'll jump in now. Okay. Uh, very, very excited about uh, what we accomplished this year around gun responsibility. So I would say there were probably three really high level, um, high profile bills. One was to ban the sale of high capacity magazines, which uh, basically if you have, you know, kind of the case for ammunition, if it has more than 10 bullets, then that cannot be sold or uh, distributed or made in Washington state. So you can still have them, but the idea is that you can't buy them um, and you can't sell them. And, um, and that, you know, we know that such a significant number of the mass shootings involve high capacity magazines. So I think this is critical. The second one was um, banning ghost guns, which are, you know, when people at, buy them online, buy the pieces and they put them together um, at home. And if they don't have a serial number, there's no way to track them um, if they are used in a crime. And we want to make sure that people are, um, you know, and they, they haven't gone through a background check if they just got them through the mail. So it's really it's banning ghost guns. And then I'm thrilled to say that the third one uh, is legislation that I sponsored that will ban the open carry of guns at city council meetings, county council meetings, school board meetings, and election sites, and banning completely all guns at ballot counting facilities um, and at school board meetings that are on school campus. So, you know, unfortunately, we have seen such vitriol and such nervousness of our elected officials. Um, especially on school boards, on city council, our election officials across the country um, who really have been, you know, putting their, ridiculously putting their lives on the line just for public service. And at the same time, even more importantly, for our citizens to be able to access democracy safely, we want to make sure everybody feels comfortable coming to, um, you know, coming to speak to their, their government without fear of intimidation and violence. And so, we heard unbelievably emotional testimony um, from school board members, city council, mayors, prosecutors, um, election officials. And I'm thrilled to say that we passed that legislation too. And those three bills will be signed next week. And that was really important. There, there was something else, um, Sam, that that made me think of when um, just talking about public safety. One of the things that has been like a buzz in, in terms of, of the public and crime and what have you, has been catalytic, catalytic converters uh, across the state. I mean, it has just been 
a rash. I don't think that there's any community that has been safe from the fact that people are going in, ripping these off cars and selling them for the metal. I don't know the technical parts of what the metal is or anything like that, but we did address that in a bill about, um, it was HB 1815, um, that was, um, I think, Cindy Ryu's bill, and it w really addressed the marketplace and making it very difficult for somebody to benefit from going and stealing somebody's catalytic converters. That was, that was um, there was quite a buzz about that throughout the Senate. Amazing. Thank you. So our next question was uh, was actually on, on folks who don't speak English as a first language. The question came in and it was, what has the legislature done to expand accessibility for people who don't speak English as a first language? Well, I, I, well, I'll jump in. Because, well, this is actually a bill from the House with, with from Representative Orwell. And I've been working with her for five, I think maybe five years, maybe it's only been four years. But she brought this to the EOGOAC, which is a work group that I sit on that's focused on the opportunity gap. And she was she was really so compelling when she first introduced this to us with the idea that there are many places, as, as we know in the 41st, you could go to any one of our communities and we have a hundred or more languages that are spoken. And in many cases, the children are doing very well, but the parents really are not that familiar with English. And um, we want, we know that when parents are involved in their kids' education, when they understand what is going on and they can support the activities, they can support their children, the kids are going to do better. And um, it's really a burden and a challenge for the schools uh, to, to welcome everyone immediately um, and to make them feel welcome, et cetera. And so this language really does require us to focus on developing the, the training, the translators, the, the even translated, um, the kinds of things that you pass out in school, making sure that the school has it in every language. And it's all coordinated through um, OSPI, which is the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction, and um, still will need some more work going forward, but it hopefully will make a difference in, in having uh, parents understand more. When, it, when a young person who is special needs has an IEP, this is a very, um, it, it's a very elaborate process and it's very confusing to parents. We wanna make sure that parents know what we're doing for their kids. And I think that this is an issue overall that parents really do wanna understand what's happening at school we want to be able to tell and share with every parent what is happening. And I think the results are going to prove out to be very satisfactory. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and language access is everywhere, right? Uh, especially, as mentioned, Washington State is the welcoming state. And we we benefit from that um, diversity and diverse uh, and the rich the richness of, of languages. Um, one of the legislation I introduced um, in healthcare is uh, the translation of prescription label, um, and um, it, it's actually is a bit boring, but I think it's the beginning. It's okay. So the representative said, "So no, it's not boring." Um, boring. It's, it's, you know, here's here's the thing: our system, our system was not created uh, with people who do not speak English in 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 our mind. And so this bill is is really the beginning step. This bill require the uh, pharmacy commission to do rulemaking, and in that process, to to convene all stakeholders um, uh, that so that we can look at how we could uh, make sure that when the patient is asking for it, when the patient provider is asking for it, or when the patient's advocate is asking for direction of use being translated and printed on the prescription label. You know, there's numbers of, um, of unfortunate um, mishap when it's come to um, medication, uh, taking medication simply because patient did not take uh, their medication correctly. And, and to have this as the beginning step with equity as the North Star, um, is, is, it shouldn't simply be sort of like, oh, the top five languages, like most spoken in, in Washington state. 
in the last two years with the pandemic, we have seen repeatedly some of the community continue to be left behind when we look at way to, to make sure that healthcare being delivered to, to each and every Washingtonian. And uh, this legislation did not uh, get through the finishing line. And you betcha I'm going to continue working on it and making sure that it's yet to the place where our system will begin. One other thing I would just mention is that in childcare, uh, we know that the, the main childcare providers are uh, speak English, Spanish, and Somali. Um, and so last year with the Fair Start for Kids Act, we, uh, we added staff that would be um, focused on childcare and making sure that everything was translated and communicated uh, in a way that childcare providers from our diverse communities uh, could understand and, and uh, communicate better. And that has, we've seen just amazing results. Um, and we also at the same time um, rewarding those who are bilingual in our childcare and um, with teaching and bilingual education. Uh, and so we know that that is a critical component as well. Thank you so much. And um, I, I wish it weren't so, but we've, we've almost run out of time. We're coming up on our hour deadline. And just to prevent us from getting booted off the system here, we're going to transition into closing remarks uh, with, a, with one of the final questions, which actually did pop up uh, a couple of times through emails here. It was people were curious, what's something you've been grateful for or pleasantly surprised by this year? And we can start with uh, Senator Wellman, then go to Rep. Ryan, and then Rep. Uh, Rep. Sen. Ha. Huh. I, I, I'm really, I'm struggling about, uh, you know, just thinking about this last session. And, and um, first of all, I was able to be um, on the floor of the Senate the last day. And I can only tell you what a wonderful feeling it was to be amongst people, amongst my my uh, fellow senators, um, just just being with them and and being you know seeing the, being part of the process there instead of this remote the remote has been it has really worked very well and, and we've been able to have i mean i think we should be grateful for the fact that over the last two years we have been able to carry on the government and the governing and the legislation that really has been necessary for this state handling very very big things while we have been in our own homes or offices in, in various places and dialing in. So I, I am grateful for the fact that we have been able to be supported as, as I'm, we are now by technical people and by technology uh, that has enabled us to carry on the work of the state. And I think quite effectively, it's not the, what, what we would choose to do, but it has worked. And um, I'm very grateful for that. I'm so, certainly, grateful that we are in in terms of 50 states we are although we were the first state hit with uh, with the coronavirus we are ranked seventh in terms of positive out, out um, outcomes and, and um, it's been tough there have been a lot of people who have not liked what has happened but in terms of the number of deaths and impact of coronavirus on our state we've actually done very very well and I'm very grateful for that because you know, it's it's people. It's it's people's mothers and fathers and children and, and grandparents and what have you that that really have been impacted. And the stories that we get to hear, because we hear a lot of stories, have been really traumatic. And so I'm very grateful that we're where we are as a state and hopefully moving past the, the virus and, and back to the new normal. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Senator Wellman, for for really speak to um, to our staff and the amazing work that they have done. So for me, um, I'm going to start with something really personal. I am grateful for my husband. Um, I'm absolutely I'm grateful for for my husband who took care of everything domestic, like um, like the whole the whole evacuation, the whole making sure that. Um, that I have the internet needed um, to connect with my colleague to do to to finish up the legislation, uh, making sure that I eat <laughs> and drink, and um, just he he did everything. I'm so grateful for for him uh, for his support, and I'm so grateful for my communities um, from those who 
who who who brought me um, lunch, who mm-hmm. sent me. Uh, it's, it's this is true, you guys. It's funny. Um, a, a a a constituent sent me um, a uh, an Uber Eat, and I never have used an Uber Eat before, and I didn't <laughs> even know what to do with it. Um, you know, um, uh, uh, friends who uh, brought me things like toothpaste and toothbrush i mean crazy things like that because when we were evacuated um we did not we did not take anything with us and so you're speaking of your home because your home was was you had to evacuate your home exactly because of the landslide i don't know if everybody knows that yes yes so um so so not only uh my husband but the entire community coming together um i I did not skip a, a beat as far as the work for the people. And um, really, I couldn't do it without without you all. And so this this work, this the outcome of this legislation um, is truly all of our work together. So thank you. Uh, and I get the honor of closing. So uh, last year, along with my colleague, Representative uh, Liz Berry, we started the Moms Caucus in the House. And um, and it has been fascinating because when I started, I, you know, as a legislator, I had two young kids in elementary school and definitely, you know, I worked on equal pay, I worked on childcare, really focused on women's issues. But as the legislature is becoming more and more diverse, um, the issues that are being raised reflect that diversity, which is so strong. Um, so this year, you know, we added a diaper benefit for low-income families. Uh, we made sure that doulas are covered by Medicaid. And that is something that is, you know, um, a lot of, um, you know, there's black um, maternal mortality is so high and doulas are often used in the black community and other diverse communities. Um, even allowing for uh, donor breast milk to be covered for um, for when women are, you know, in surgery or there's an emergency as a newborn baby. So just across the board, these issues that have come forward because of the diversity in gender and in uh, racial equity among our members. And I'm unbelievably surprised that I think there's at least 10 members in the House who are retiring this year or leaving for other reasons. And, you know, there's just this constant turnover, which is which brings a richness to the legislature because we have new experiences that come forward. And I'm just always so honored to work with uh, my two colleagues right here. I know that the three of us are so honored to represent the 41st district, um, our diverse cities, our diverse constituents, our amazing school five school districts um, and everything, all the problems uh, concerns, issues, um, strengths that we bring uh, to Washington State. So on behalf of the three of us, I want to thank you all for um, for allowing us to address you today and to, to represent you in the legislature. Um, and this has been a great discussion. Well, thank you so much, everyone. We're joined from people all across the internet right now from uh, from a couple different Facebook streams and a couple different uh, YouTube streams as well. We're just so grateful that you joined on our second virtual town hall for the 41st Legislative District Delegation. And we'll just, with that, wave goodbye. Thank you so much for taking this time out of your busy, busy day. We're going to end the stream here and wish you a good rest of the month. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye.